Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum. What is the point of me learning this superfluous piece of knowledge? I don't really understand this. I don't get this. What's the point of me learning this? This topic is important because in the world today, we have a worldview which is challenging Islam, which is the worldview of new atheism. So if there is a worldview of new atheism, and there is a particular implication of being an atheist, if there's a particular outcome of being an atheist, which I'm going to argue today as nihilism, then we need to understand we have to show people the trajectory where atheism leads to. Why? The reason is because that is something that's going to help them decide whether they should be an atheist or whether they should reconsider atheism. What's interesting about this topic is this is something that's very close to my heart because I know people that went through nihilism and they came to Islam. And this isn't, that's why it's not like the ingredients of a toothpaste. Yeah? This is really important knowledge. It's really important knowledge because it has real life implications. Now, there's a YouTube channel called Pondering Soul. Uh, he is um, a brother who used to be an atheist and he became a Muslim. Um, his name is Yusuf. And I wanted to share his story and how it relates to nihilism and atheism because that story is a small door to understand the entire um, issue of nihilism in the West. And I thought that story was quite interesting, right? So Yusuf, his uh, non-Muslim name was Sean. He was somebody who became an atheist. He used to have some sort of Christianized background, but he became an atheist. Now, when he became an atheist, he decided, let me live my life in a hedonistic way. Let me live my life in a way that I follow my desires. I do what I want. You know, the night slogan, just do it, right? So he decided to do that and then he tried everything. And he basically realized none of these things are making me happy. And in life, there doesn't seem to be meaning. There doesn't seem to be purpose. None of these things make sense. And then he told me nihilism it drove him away, it pushed him away from atheism because he was thinking, look, this can't just be it and it started making him, him question faith and what is faith and then he looked into Buddhism, <coughs> Hinduism, uh, I think Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, Christianity, just different faiths. He started looking into different faiths, then he looked into Islam and Alhamdulillah he became Muslim. And that journey is a very beautiful journey because it shows you that if you take the actual worldview of atheism, they try and package it in a very beautiful way. Yeah? You become an atheist, you, you're going to be living a very happy life, everything's going to be fantastic, you're going to be free. This is one of the things they talk about, freedom, you're going to be feeling great, you're going to be fantastic. When in reality, nihilism is the actual implication of atheism. So we're going to be covering what is nihilism, why does atheism lead to nihilism and why faith is the only answer to the issue of nihilism? So essentially, it is the worldview that there is no hope, there is no meaning, there is no value, there is no purpose. All of these things go, right? It's a very dark place to be, hence the title Atheism to Nihilism, The Dark Path. Friedrich Nietzsche, he is one of the most important figures when it comes to nihilism, right? Now, he's actually called by some as a prophet. Not a prophet in the conventional sense that, you know, we have revealed religion and we have God giving prophets. But a prophet he is called by some because he made predictions which were bold and which are being confirmed today. So he made a prediction that Europe's going to go through this existential crisis, right? Now, about 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago, when he was alive and he was writing, and he gives the parable of the madman, right? So because of the, because of the advance of science and people becoming godless, he, he wanted to show people the implications. So he, he, he gives the story of the madman. So the madman, he runs out into the market. 
and he has this lantern with him. And he starts saying, God is dead. Right? He starts saying, God is dead. God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. How shall we comfort ourselves? The murderer, the murderers of all murderers. Right? So the madman in his parable, he goes around telling people, look, what are we going to do? We just killed God in the sense that science has got rid of God. What are we going to do? He's going around talking to everybody and they just don't seem to get it. And the madman, he throws down his lantern and then he says, I've come too early. Meaning these people do not understand the implications of atheism yet. They do not understand the implications of a godless worldview. They don't understand what I'm trying to say about life being meaningless. So what Nietzsche predicted is in the future Europe is going to go through an existential crisis. And if you read the works of prominent atheist academics, whether they are even popularizers like Sam Harris, who's now speaking about spirituality, or Douglas Murray, who's speaking about the need for faith. You are seeing that Europeans and European civilizations and people from that part, from the Western world, are starting to realize we need meaning, we need purpose, we need value, we need these actual things. Now, Arthur Schopenhauer, a famous uh, philosopher, he was giving a reason why people are in search of meaning. He was, you know, because we all are looking for meaning. We want meaning. We want to find out. So he had this formula for why people are looking for meaning. And why, regardless of everything you have in your life, you are going to search for meaning. What he said is that there are two factors which every single human being, including myself and everybody in this room, will go through. These two factors make it so that we have to look for purpose. We have to look for meaning, we have to look for value. What he said is that suffering coupled with death, the inevitable death which is going to come, makes us look for meaning. That's why we look for meaning. We look for meaning because we want to live a life that's bearable and we want to look forward to something. We want to look forward to another world, or like in, in Nietzsche, he calls this like um, the true world, right? There's a, there's, so there's another world apart from this world, and this, this world is, say, inferior, and that world is greater. Whatever you go through in this life, if you finally get to another world, all of what you go through in this life doesn't matter. So Nietzsche's whole argument is that Christianity provided that, but now Christianity at his time was dying, so he said, well, where are we going to find the comfort? What's interesting about this is that when we start to think about the implications of a hardcore materialistic, naturalistic worldview, the implications are scary. They're actually scary. And they're actually something that you start to realize why Nietzsche was going through so much pain and why philosophers who recognize the problem of nihilism, why they are in so much trauma. Consider this. We have, anyone know who that is? Lenin. Lenin, right? So we have Lenin. Now on the left, that's not Lenin, that's a mannequin, right? On the right, that's Lenin. Now, I just want you to consider something. If somebody goes up to the man on the left, the mannequin on the left, and just takes a sledgehammer, a sledgehammer, right? And whacks Lenin's mannequin on the head. And the same thing happens, somebody from the crowd comes up to the real living Lenin while he's alive and hits him with a sledgehammer. Both case scenarios, there's a sledgehammer and it's being smacked into the head of either the mannequin or into the real person. Is there a difference between the two? Raise your hands if you think there's a difference between the live specimen and the mannequin. Right? Even with Lenin, even with, you know, a character as nasty as that, we would recognize, no, there is a difference. But I want you to imagine something. From a cold, hard, materialistic point of view, the only difference between them is what? 
is actually the rearrangement of matter. Bottom down, they're both atoms. Bottom down, there's no soul, there's no rule. So they're both the exact same thing. So this, if this doesn't scare you, if this doesn't diminish you, if this doesn't devalue the human experience, then nothing else will. Which is why Nietzsche, Schopenhauer and other nihilists even alive today, they are trying to overcome nihilism and they wanted to overcome nihilism. Now, when we think about the modern world, right, we think, oh, you know, those philosophers, you know, they're just talking nonsense and they're just writing and who really cares and we live in the modern world. It doesn't impact us. That's just, you know, in Victorian England or other places, they may have had these issues. What's interesting is that most people who are atheists, they don't recognize nihilism and they probably haven't heard of the name because they haven't thought about it. That's one of the problems. Nietzsche, when his, the parable of his madman that's going around telling people, listen, we killed God apparently, right? And where's the meaning? Where's the, what are we going to do with our lives? People don't recognize what he's saying. Likewise, Nietzsche, what he said is people are going to eventually recognize it, eventually. And you're starting to see this. Now, in a book called Realms of Meaning, Philip Phoenix, what he does is he actually shows reasons why. In the modern world, the problem of nihilism is actually going to be worse is actually going to be worse. And he gives four reasons why this is going to be the case. The first is the spirit of criticism and skepticism which dominate the domains of science and philosophy among many other fields. So it's just the general skepticism. You know, question everything. Nothing is sacred. Nothing is valuable. There's no true authority, right? So that skepticism which is so much hyped and is, is thought of as a fantastic thing, he says is one of the causes. Another cause is the tendency towards depersonalization and the fragmentation of complex societies due to industrialization and alienation. I'll give you a simple example of this. Urbanization. You have villages where you have a person who knows their second cousin, third cousin, fourth cousin, fifth cousin. You have a funeral which is large. You have women of the household who every single day they're probably interacting with 10, 15 other women. This is like a village life. As society becomes urbanized, right? As you move away from the village type areas, you, you're going to start to see a lot of people becoming away from their relatives and, and their other um, sort of uh, structures, so particular you know, groupings that they may have in the villages and other places. And you're starting to see that actually society is, is prime for this type of alienation. And you find in major cities like London, major cities like London, which people think of London, think fantastic, big city, very busy. One of the biggest issues in London is actually loneliness. People don't talk to their neighbors. Walaikum salam. No one interacts the way that they do in a village area or in smaller towns. So that's another cause. Another cause, interestingly, what we think of as good, is actually a cause of nihilism, is overabundance of both things and information, inevitably overwhelming the modern citizen. You know, a human being, we are very, we're very strange creatures. We want something, but that thing is usually bad for us. I'll give you an example. Somebody goes to a restaurant and they're like, I want to go to a buffet where there's like 50 dishes. When in reality, Psychological studies have shown when you give human beings too much choice, which they want, that choice actually makes them unhappy. So it's the same thing. We have an overabundance of information and things, and this is also another cause. Another interesting one is rapid rates of change which leave a constant feeling of impermanence and lack of security. I'll give you guys an example so you can remember. Your great-grandfather, I just want you to imagine your great-grandfather, no, not your great-grandfather, you can't remember him, your grandfather. I want you to go from this, your grandfather, when he was alive, say maybe 100 years ago, no, well, 70 years ago, something like this, when he was young, that grandfather, 
his grandfather, which is, say, 80 years earlier, the difference between the two worlds wasn't that great. It wasn't that great. It, the difference between this grandfather and his grandfather wasn't that great. The difference between this grandfather and his grandfather wasn't that great. The world that they were inheriting, that they were preparing their children for, wasn't really that different. So if you go back to, say, 1850, you go back 1750, go back 1650, go back 1550, there's not that much difference. Now, you go back 10 years, the world's totally different. 30 years ago, no one would have thought the world would be the way it is right now with internet, with AI, with all these things. The state of rapid change is creating this insecurity in us about the fact that nothing remains permanent and of course the lack of security. Now, so even in the modern world, you will find people who seemingly have everything. They have wealth, they have money, they have fame, they have supposedly everything that's supposed to make you happy in the capitalist dream. Yet you will find People like Robin Williams, who was making the world laugh, but inside he was crying himself. And he ended up committing suicide. And you find people who we are told by society that this is the fantastic thing, that if you do, you'll get this, you'll be happy. You find those same people, they're not happy. And life is em empty and meaningless. So what's the solutions? Let's go over a few solutions. When it comes to solutions, we need to look at these solutions in a very objective way. Because it's very difficult. It's very difficult when sometimes people put forward conclusions and you know what? They sound really good, but in reality, there's not really that much there. There's not that really, there's not really, it's not really thought through that well. So as we go through these, I want you to first sympathize with the conclusion, sympathize with the conclusion, and then we're going to go over why this conclusion doesn't actually make sense. So one of the ways which some atheists are saying we account for the fact that there is no meaning is to create your own meaning. Is to say, do you know what? There's no meaning, there's no purpose, there's no value, there's none of these things. But let's just make it ourselves. In fact, for some atheists, for some nihilists who are trying to escape nihilism, they would say, look, rather than God giving us meaning, rather than God giving us value, we can actually create our own value, our own meaning, our own purpose. We don't need God for that. We can actually do it ourselves. In fact, they try and argue, this is more powerful. But there's a few issues with this. One of the issues is, when we had the two world idea, two world as in you have this imperfect world, and then you have a perfect world. So whether you had the Plato's world of forms, or with uh, Abrahamic religions, you had this lowly life and you had the next life. The, the people who hold, held those views, whether it was Plato or it was an Abrahamic, um, the follower of an Abrahamic religion, they believed with certainty that this life is temporal and the other life is eternal. But if you make it yourself, you will know always that this is nonsense. I just made this up. <coughs> Secondly, the whole charge against religion, the entire charge against religion is you just have make-belief. You just have an invented religion. How different is that from playing make-belief? It, it, it's not. It's the, exact, it's the exact same thing. So European civilization moved away from Christianity because they said it was false. And a cause of them moving away was them accepting a scientific worldview. So if they go back to make belief, then why don't they just go back to Christianity? And what's really interesting now is atheists are speaking about the importance of faith, as long as someone else believes. You will find atheists actually speaking about how faith is a good thing. Because when in a society, 
you don't have a narrative of faith and society at large becomes nihilistic, that society is going to disintegrate. So make-belief, the problem with make-belief is not only that it is false and it will never really even work pragmatically, secondly, you can make anything. You can say, my make-belief is um, the purpose of life is to conquer other countries and subjugate them. My purpose of life is I'm going to study frogs for the rest of my life. I mean, you could just make up anything and there's no way of adjudicating between what is, uh, what is good and what is bad. Okay, anyone guess what this solution is? Being patriotic, Being patriotic. fantastic, fantastic. Being patriotic. Being nationalistic. Why? Because one way to give your life meaning is by connecting with something greater than yourself. <coughs> so the whole idea of nationalism, of ideologies like Marxism, communism, is because you are not just an individual, but you're part of a whole. So even if you die, even if you go away, everything in your life you're working for something that's going to carry on after you die and you're working for a particular goal that's higher than yourself. So nationalism is something, as we know, the First World War, it had many different causes. But according to academics, something interesting also happened. The intellectual elite who you normally see is anti-war, usually. They were pro-war before the first war, before the first world war. Not only were they pro-war, they were going through this phase of nihilism and life being empty and meaningless. And that was according to academics, one of the causes of them being supportive of World War I. If life is meaningless, then anything really goes. You know, you, you, you have to have this thing called escapism. You have to you have to keep yourself busy. So one of the one of the ways that people escape nihilism on a day-to-day -day basis, who recognize nihilism, is by keeping themselves busy all the time, continuously busy. Those same people, if you leave them alone in a spot without their phone, without their friends, without any communication, without something to do, and they just start reflecting about their life, that's when the dark clouds of nihilism will actually hit them. Which is why people like that don't want to be on their own. They actually want to be surrounded. Now we know, we know fascism, nationalism and these ideologies fundamentally whatever you're fighting for, whatever group it is, that is again something that is purely arbitrary. You could be in one group or another. So you giving meaning to that thing is, it, it has no meaning just because you've given it meaning. So. Even today, if you look at the New Atheist Movement, if you look at the Humanist Movement, if you look at the Feminist Movement, these movements, they give a type of false meaning to the adherents, which makes life a little bit more bearable. So, what's very interesting is, from a nihilistic point of view, it doesn't matter whether you're part of feminism, or whether you're part of memonism, or whether you are a social Darwinist. It doesn't matter. Yet, it is just something to keep people busy. So this solution, we know, is, is definitely not a solution that we want to explore. Okay, here's a solution which you do find atheists talking about. Just do science. Just do science, as if as if science is a thing in of itself. If I just, if, if I was to talk to you about maths, I would say I believe in maths and we need to have a mathematical uh, way of life. You guys are gonna say, but that's not a worldview, that's just a subject. What value, because Nazis can use mathematics and they can use it for evil ends, right? You can have Quakers using mathematics for another end. Mathematics in of itself is nothing, you need values before that. So science is not something on its own, you actually need values. Some values to actually 
do something. So this whole thing of, look, let's just do science. Let's just make the world a better place. Make the world a better place. A friend of mine who used to be a nihilist, he said that when he was a nihilist, he thought, what's the point of even getting out of bed? Because the universe is, if you, if you accept a naturalistic point of view, it's a cosmic accident. Everything is a cosmic accident. So if we are a cosmic accident, then how can we make the world better? So the way he explained it to me is, if the world is pointless, how can you make the pointless better? The pointless can only become pointless. Not, not become, but it's just going to remain pointless. You, there's no way of improving. So when they talk about, let's work for progress, let's work for humanity, let's work for the, uh, against climate change, let's, that's what you find atheists doing now. The atheists, they're trying to maintain their sheep. And how do they maintain them? By giving them two things. By telling them their life is meaningful, and by telling them that they are important. What's very interesting is even atheist academic, you could call him an academic, but an atheist popularizer, right? Like Douglas Murray. Even he says human rights, the whole movement of human rights. First, human rights, as we know, is anchored in God. You know, they believed in self-evident rights which God gave, which are unassailable and immutable and whatnot. He said this is a post-Christian dream. And this is not something which can be justified from a secular point of view in terms of his moorings, in terms of his beginnings. So this, this whole atheistic movement that we see in the world today, they're continuously trying to get their followers latched on to something, either human rights or humanism or feminism or progress or waking the, making the world better or focusing on climate change. These are all distractions because they're trying to give people a meaning and they're trying to make people think, look, your life is significant, right? But the fact is that all of those things are still arbitrary. It's just, it doesn't take much for you to just scratch the surface and you start to realize it all falls apart. So this whole thing about let's believe in science and, and science is fantastic. Firstly, science, like I mentioned, is not a worldview in of itself. And secondly, and this is interesting what Nietzsche says, it was people accepting a supposed scientific view of the world which led to nihilism in the first place. That was the very thing which led to nihilism in the first place. So Nietzsche says about this, and Nietzsche is not anti-science, but he just says this thing which I, th I thought was really <laughs> ironic because the, the people today, the atheists today are saying, let's believe in science and focus on science and do this and do that. That was the very cause of the Europeans moving away from Christianity, right? So he says this very funny thing. A scientific interpretation of the world, as you understand it, might still be one of the stupidest, that is to say, the most destitute of significance of all possible world explanations. Now for him, somebody who is well respected in the Western world, in Western philosophy, in the Western tradition, to call the scientific view the stupidest <laughs> is saying something. Now he's not saying, if you accept scientific conclusions, you're stupid. What he's saying is, if you say we just want a scientific interpretation of the world, like I mentioned at the beginning, a scientific interpretation of the world would mean what? There's no meaning, there's no value, there's no purpose, there's no morality, there's no... None of these things, right? It's just the two Lenins, right? It's all atoms. There's no difference. So he said it's, it's devoid. It's devoid of any significance. So you can't say, yeah, science is the solution to nihilism when it was science which actually caused European civilization to go down the slippery slope of atheism, which eventually leads to nihilism. So what he basically says is this. Nietzsche argues that you have to have something beyond yourself. You have to. To make this life, the suffering in this life, and the inevitable death, to make it bearable, you need to give that suffering a meaning. Now with us as Muslims, 
with us as Muslims or, or people of Abrahamic faith, we can say that. We can say it does have actually a meaning. There is a purpose. There is a hereafter. But then when you move away from that, you will fall into the slippery slope. Now what he says is this. Gradually man has become a fantastic animal that has to fulfill one more condition of existence than any other animal. Man has to believe, to know, from time to time, why he exists. His race cannot flourish without a periodic trust in life. So, even in, from a naturalistic perspective, we're just one ape amongst others, right? We're just one animal amongst this vast kingdom. But there's something unique. <laughs> So regardless of how much you try and shove down people's heads that, you know, we evolve by natural selection, random mutations, and, and we're all just like, you know, there's no difference between human being and bacteria in terms of the tree of life. Even the most hardcore militant philosophers and atheists recognize there's something different about the human being. You'll find other animals which are more than happy, they're not having existential crises, right? Yet you find the human being who wants to know why am I? here what is the point of life and what's very interesting about this is that human exceptionalism which they argue against they say there's no such thing as human exceptionalism we're all the same as the same as everything else in nature yet it is that very human that you say is not exceptional who discovered the supposed truth of darwinian evolution that we are not exceptional which other animal worked out Darwinian evolution or quantum mechanics or string theory or whatever, right? Now, one more solution. So we try different solutions. Let's try one more solution. One more solution is maybe let's just go back to our origins from a naturalistic perspective. Let's stop asking that question. Let's stop, you know, trying to look for meaning. Let's just give up on that. Forget meaning. Let's just understand that, look, we evolved to survive and reproduce and let's just survive and reproduce and stop worrying about meaning. Now from the selfish gene, Dawkins, although he speaks about many different aspects of evolutionary theory, there is one thing that he says or one theme in his book which I found very interesting, which he speaks about the rationale of human existence from a Darwinian perspective. So he says, we are survival machines, robot vehicles blindly programmed to preserve the selfish molecules known as genes. This is a truth which still fills me with astonishment. He's on his own there, I don't know why that's astonishing. They are in you and me, speaking about the genes. They are in you and me, they created us body and mind and the, their preservation is the ultimate rationale for our existence so let's just go back let's just understand okay maybe that's just what we got to do we just got to survive and reproduce and that's all we got to do what's interesting is he's the most well-known darwinist in the world today yet he says we need to act in a way that's non-Darwinian. We need to act in a way that's anti-Darwinian. He doesn't believe that this is the purpose of life. He thinks we need something else. Now usually when people, um, uh, usually when you bring to people Darwinian evolution, then you give them this implication. They say this is a naturalistic fallacy. You can't go from is to ought. You can't go from a supposed fact to what the world should be like. But look, if there are things about our origin which you want us to accept, which is Darwinism, naturalism, then of course they are going to inform the decisions that we're going to make. So if we go along with what you're saying in terms of the history of life, this is one potential avenue, which is we just survive and reproduce. And we actually do that. Now when you go out in the world and you go to a World Atheist Convention, right, happening anywhere across the world, Try and convince people there, the hardcore militant atheists who want us to accept a naturalistic story, even they will not accept it. Even Richard Dawkins does not accept this is good enough. What's interesting is human beings, we cannot survive 
without meaning. Although the very purpose of our life, supposedly the rationale of our existence is the preservation of our genes, survival and reproduction. This is true when we look at the, the, the history of human life on earth. So the anthropologist Ernst Becker, he says this very interesting thing, and I, I thought this was phenomenal, right? And I didn't even know this evidence actually existed. He said, anthropologists have long known that when a tribe of people lose their feeling for their way of life, lose that feeling their way of life is worthwhile, they may stop reproducing or in large numbers simply lie down and die beside streams full of fish. Food is not the primary nourishment of man. That makes no sense from a Darwinian perspective. You should be, you know, uh, passing on your genes, focusing on your genes, focusing on your inclusive fitness. How does that make any sense? If we evolve for a particular end, now of course evolution it doesn't work like for an end, but if that's how we evolved, then why would we favor the meaning of life, the purpose of life, over survival and reproduction. So look, what have we done so far? Atheism leads to nihilism. Nihilism, you can try and deal with it in a few ways. You can do what majority of atheists do, which what they were doing at Nietzsche's time, which is ignoring it, escaping it, getting yourself busy and stuff so you don't focus on it. Or you can bite the bullet like Nietzsche did and accept that nihilism does actually exist and then look for particular solutions. You can make your own solutions, you can connect to something greater supposedly like nationalism or some sort of ideology, or you can say, okay, do you know what, um, let's, let's look into science, but again, science is a thing which led us supposedly back to uh, nihilism. We can't even go back to our origins, survival and reproduction. There is no solution. If meaning is to be in our lives, it has to be from a source outside of human beings. And this is where we bring in faith. Allah says in the Quran, truly it is in the remembrance of Allah do hearts find peace. Someone may have everything in this world. I'll give you a little thought experiment. Someone may have everything in this world. I'll go up to somebody in the street here and I'll say to them, do you know what? I am willing to give you a trillion dollars. You're going to get a trillion dollars. You can buy what you want. You can buy an island. You can buy whatever you want in the world. My condition is you are not allowed to talk to anybody and you're going to cut yourself off from your friends and from your family and you're not allowed to talk to any strangers online or offline. Give them a big screen, let them watch Netflix, YouTube, whatever. Have all the facilities in the world, food, traveling, whatever, cars. But just tell them you are not allowed to have a relationship with another human being. No one will accept that because a millionaire who doesn't have friends, he is actually poor. Human beings are happier Depend, uh, are much more happier when they have a greater social network than being rich and not having any genuine friends. That's to do with relationships. What about the human being who doesn't have a relationship with Allah? Allah says, whoever turns away from my remembrance, he will have a depressed life. And this is not just something, not just something which is written in a book. People have tried and tested this out. They tried to live their life in a hedonistic way. And they've been unhappy. And they tried to live their life in a way that they try and be spiritual. And they recognize, do you know what? This spirituality, this is what truly gives me happiness. And like I mentioned earlier on in the talk, atheists are now starting to talk about meditation. Anyone here heard of the book Sapiens? Yuval Noah Hariri, very, fam very famous book, right? The author of the book, Sapiens, the guy who's popularizing the idea of uh, evolution, right? How many children does he have? Yeah. None. He actually has dogs. How does that make sense from an evolutionary perspective? And he talks about meditation 
and he meditates one hour in the morning, one hour in the evening, and a certain part of the year he actually meditates. How does that help your survival and reproduction? Sam Harris, Douglas Murray, Yuval Noah Hariri, you find so many of these atheists. They're talking about meditation, or the need for faith, or spirituality. Why? Because they're fighting against their true nature. Allah created us with a fitrah. And Allah gave us a soul. We're not just, you know, that example of Lenin, you know, he's, he's just molecules. No, with us, we have a soul. And the soul cannot be fed through a burger, right? The soul cannot be fed through having lots of relationships with women. It, the soul cannot be fed through material things because the soul is immaterial. So it can only be fed by the one who created it. And Allah created the soul. And the food for the soul is zikr, is remembrance of Allah. The food for this soul is not going to be something physical. Everything good I've said is from Allah. Every mistake is from myself. Jazakallah khair for listening. Ah, go back a few slides. Which one? Yeah,